I'm going to introduce our speaker. She'll come up after the choir uh, leads us in worship as well. Uh, but uh, Tina Ramirez grew up in Huntington Beach. She went to Vanguard University, a little school uh, down the coast, which we have some competitive things with, but we, uh, we love. Uh, she, she got a, her, her story is fascinating, and I'm just going to say a few things. Uh, she is doing some of the most interesting and uh, courageous work I know of. Uh, for God and his kingdom and for the, the needs of the world. And she's going to tell you about that. I, you know, I, we have so many great folks speak here. I, I just love Tina Ramirez. I'm just so glad you're here, Tina. Uh, but she did a BA and a, and a, in history and political science, an MA uh, in education, taught in secondary schools. She's received other degrees in human rights, has written widely. She is involved in some of the hardest and most difficult and most oppressive places in the world. Uh, uh, advocating for the rights of the oppressed. Uh, she has an organization called Hardwired, and I think she'll probably say something about that. But Tina, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, after the choir sings, we welcome you up here to, uh, to the pulpit and to speak to us. Lord bless you. I was a little worried when everybody started booing over Vanguard. I didn't play sports, so you don't have to worry about anything. Um, <laughs> the most unathletic person you'll ever meet, so uh, you're okay. <laughs> We're good. Um, no, it's an honor for me to be here today and just to worship with you and to share with you the journey that God's taken me on the last 20 years since I left Vanguard. And um, it's taken me to 30 different countries around the world and working with a lot of believers that worship um, in many different ways. And so I always love the diversity that we get, and tonight, today was really fun. I enjoyed the worship, so I thank the band and everyone that, that led us in that praise. Um, the, the young man that gave the prayer a minute ago really reminded me of one of the things I want to share about today, which is that it's very clear, I think, not just in this past week, but in the past year in our own country, that we live in a very broken world. Is that right? I think we can all feel that. Um, there's a lot of hate, there's a lot of intolerance, and as I was preparing to speak today, the word that came to me was peacemaker, and that's the journey that God's had me on the last 20 years, but it's hopefully a word that God will um, really plant in your heart today and give you a vision for how you can become a peacemaker. The Beatitudes, uh, there's many, you know, great scriptures in there, but there's two in particular I want to share. One is, you know, blessed are the persecuted. Um, and right before that, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. I've seen a lot of people that are persecuted around the world, uh, but I haven't seen as many peacemakers. And so I, uh, my message for today is to encourage you to think as I share about the journey God's taken me on and what we've been able to do. Um, how can you be a peacemaker in this world? Uh, how can you do what Christ has called us to do, which is to reconcile the world to himself? Um, he's given that ministry to each one of us. And so as I share, I want you to be thinking about what does that mean for me? How can I be a peacemaker? Because the reality is most of you are not living in persecution, but um, you, are, you are living in freedom, and so you have this um, really special opportunity to be a peacemaker and to bring freedom to those that don't have it, and in particular people that are suffering uh, because of their faith. So what's exciting is to be here where we can worship in freedom, right? But the reality in the world is that about four out of five people in the world don't have the freedom that we just took advantage of this morning. If they pray, if they worship, if they do anything publicly about their faith, uh, they're imprisoned, they're harassed, they're discriminated against. And in our lifetime, we're witnessing um, really extreme persecution around the world where it's getting, it's getting worse and worse every year. But in particular, I want to share about what's happening in the Middle East, because in the Middle East, we're experiencing or we're witnessing in our own lifetime the near erasure of the church there. Uh, it's troubling because this is where Christ is from, right? He's from Israel. And right next door, Thomas started a church in Iraq and in Syria. And that church uh, has gone through some of the worst persecution uh, that we could imagine. Um, how many of you have watched Survivor or The Great Race or The Bachelor? Yes, okay. You have to be honest, right? 
All right, well, if you've seen any of those, the person that created all those, those shows um, is Mark Burnett, and he also created the Bible and the AD series, an amazing Christian. And um, I remember one time Mark was being interviewed. <laughs> You're still laughing about The Bachelor. <laughs> Something special must have happened this week. I don't know. I don't watch it. <laughs> um, well, anyway, he was sitting in an interview, and of course, people want to ask him about these great shows and his great career. And he said, you know, we're sitting here drinking our lattes and hanging out talking, and right at this minute, Christians are being killed in the Middle East. And I, you know, for somebody that's reached, you know, that pinnacle of success to just kind of lay that out on the table in the middle of this interview is pretty bold. And, but it was the reality that was something was stirring in his heart. How is it that I can sit here and drink my chai tea or my coffee or whatever while Christians are suffering in the Middle East? Paul says, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. Um, but I know when I grew up, I didn't know about the persecution of Christians around the world. Um, it wasn't until I came to college, like many of you, that I learned that Christians suffered at all. So this might be the first time that you're hearing about it, and I'm sure that you will never drink a latte or a chai or coffee the same. Um, I can assure you that I've never drank one the same after thinking about it, because it just constantly comes back in my mind, what can we do? Because when one part of the body is suffering, we're all suffering. And the reality is that if four out of five people in the world are living where they're being attacked for their faith, and it, every year this gets worse, we have to do something because the space is shrinking all around us, and eventually it will touch us. But if we want people to be free, we need to stand up and defend their freedom, both here and around the world. Um, so we simply can't afford to do nothing. After I was in college, this, I had learned about these ideas and um, wanted to do something, but I didn't know what to do. So I became a teacher and was very excited about teaching, but I still had this passion in my heart. And so God opened up the doors for me to, um, to go and to extend my education and to begin to work in a field where I could defend people that were persecuted in Washington, D.C. So for the last 15 years, that's where I've been. And I got to work with members of the U.S. Congress. We set up uh, a bipartisan caucus for members of Congress. Yes, they did something bipartisan. Um, and there are about 60 members last I checked after I've, I've uh, there were about 50 when I left there. Uh, and these members worked on helping people get out of prison, changed laws, rescuing people from oppression. It was very exciting. They did it for people of all faiths. And um, it was just an amazing movement that happened in Congress. It was one of the most active ca caucuses that was in a positive, you know, had a positive approach to something. Um, but sadly, I knew it was never t enough that by the time we got there in Congress, by the time people from other countries came to us and asked for help, it was always too late. Um, it, it would take massive efforts. Um, often we'd have to send a, a um, Secretary of State or a former president to go to a country and get somebody out like North Korea or China or Iran or whatever. And um, when the government shifted and we had new administration, uh, sometimes it would take longer. So. It was very difficult, and I realized that the people that were persecuted needed help immediately, right on the ground. You see, in America, we can, we can go next door, we can open up our door, or the white pages, and we have somebody that's ready and willing to defend us. Sometimes at a cost, sometimes not. But you always have somebody ready to defend you and your religious freedom. But in the rest of the world, that's simply not the case. So if you leave here and you go to China or Iran, or, God forbid, if you go to North Korea, you're somebody like Otto Warmbrier, the reality isn't that you have somebody to defend you. It's a very different reality. You, you, you end up in the reality of everybody else in the world that doesn't have the freedom that we have um, to worship. They live under harassment, attack, discrimination, marginalization, isolation. They worship, um, it, worship to them as a life and death reality every day. So that's the reality, and they don't have somebody to defend them. So I realized, after working in Congress for these years, that we needed to do something to give people advocates, leaders, peacemakers, that would stand in their defense. So I want to share a few of those um, people that we got to meet in Iraq in particular. Um, a few years ago, you may remember that major crisis unfolded 
in Iraq and across the Middle East, Iraq and Syria. Uh, a terrorist group named ISIS came in and uh, just destroyed entire villages, gave Christians 24 hours notice to basically pack up and leave or convert or be killed. And so overnight, an entire Christian community in northern Iraq was displaced, over like 150,000 people in 24 hours. Um, in other parts of northern Iraq, the Yazidi community, which are like ancient Zoroastrians, were not given the option of convert or die because they weren't people of the book. They were um, simply put in a room and all the, young, all the boys were slaughtered and the girls were sold into sexual slavery. Um, Shia Muslims were not given the option of following ISIS. They were beheaded and put in the streets as a, as a sign um, that you fall in line or this is what happens to you if you're a Muslim. So nobody was free, everybody was attacked. And I remember when the crisis first started, I'd been working on Iraq for years in Congress and obviously we saw the writing on the wall, very poignant since it, that happened in Iraq and Babylon, but we, we could see that persecution was growing, it was getting worse and something bad was gonna happen. But there was never enough that we could do through Congress to change it. Um, Republican and Democrat presidential administrations said, we can address the problem with the military. We can address the problem with humanitarian aid. But as we know, those, have never, those solutions have never worked. They haven't resolved the problem. The problem, this conflict, this hate and intolerance is still growing. And it was, it was boiling. And then it emerged in this terrorist group that was the most nihilistic uh, form of extremism we've seen in our lifetime. So when it unfolded, I had, I had traveled to Iraq many times before and my friends called me on the phone uh, and they were begging for help. They said, Tina, we are sitting here on our knees. We've been praying for six hours. Has anyone been on their knees for six hours? I have not. But I can tell you, when they called me and said that, I, they said, we've been praying for six hours. Um, ISIS had pushed all of these Christians and everybody out, and they were all trying to get into Erbil, the city, the capital of Kurdistan, which was still free at the time. And they were terrified that ISIS was going to come in. And they knew what would happen if they did. And so they said, please pray for us. They said, we, we've already been refugees, the particular group that called me. And we decided, after praying, that we're not going to leave, we're going to stay here. Because we don't want to have to run again and keep running to be, to be able to be who we are. So we're going to stay and we're going to pray. And um, so an hour went by, another hour, and I just prayed for them. It was the middle of the night. And then finally they called me and they said that they heard planes. It was the United States. We had sent our Air Force to push ISIS back. It was a miracle. So the only reason Erbil didn't fall and thousands and thousands of more people weren't, weren't killed is because um, the government did send their planes to help. But um, that wasn't enough for the thousands that had already been affected, already been killed or, or um, displaced. And it wasn't enough to stop the spread of this ideology that spread like a cancer throughout the society. Not just in the areas that ISIS controlled, they had control of 600,000 children in Mosul. But even outside of the areas that ISIS controlled, we met teachers who shared with us stories where um, they saw children playing games where they were beheading people. And it was because they were identifying with ISIS even without realizing it. Um, we met one woman. So a few weeks after this happened, I thought, okay, God, I obviously have to go and do something to help. And thankfully, at that time, we had Hardwired, the organization I started. And Hardwired had for a couple of years, and if you go back to the other message I gave at, at uh, Chapel a few years ago, Hardwired had helped um, bring freedom to um, persecuted believers in Sudan in a really miraculous way. Um, God worked. You can get the message and hear about it. But um, we were prepared because we knew that we could never, the government would never be able to stop this cancer of what was happening, this conflict. So we decided um, as an organization that we were going to establish leaders to stand in defense, peacemakers in these countries, to stand in defense of religious freedom. They wouldn't just be Christians, they would be people of all faiths, because often if you're a minority in these countries, which Christians often are, uh, you can't 
look to your fellow minority for help. You have to find a major somebody in the majority to help you. And so that's what we did. We worked with, um, we worked with leaders in the majority and in the minority across Sudan to help. And then we went to Iraq and we said, okay, now we're ready, let's go back. So we went into Iraq and we were able to establish 60 leaders from all different religious communities to defend religious freedom. Now, um, they were deployed throughout their communities to teach about religious freedom. Some taught in schools, some taught in the media. It was amazing. And what we saw is there was a law that was passed at one point where the government was going to try to force children to convert to Islam. And these leaders from all different faiths came together with about 100 more leaders that they galvanized around them. And they got the the um, president to not sign the law. So it went back to parliament and has to be revised now. But it was a huge praise because that law would have been passed had these leaders not known how to defend religious freedom or not understood why it was of value to them. And I think the best way I can explain why they would do this is the story of this judge that I met in our leader, in our training. He was um, from Mosul and he had uh, had to flee. He was on the, the court in charge of the rep of reparations for the victims of terrorism. And when he uh, fled, his family remained behind. And he um, was went through the training, he was really moved. So he went to the Christians and the Yazidis. After the training, he said, I'm gonna stand up for you in the courts. I'm gonna make sure you have justice. And of course, in the midst of this genocide, that was great. I mean, you couldn't have imagined a better leader or peacemaker to have created in this environment. But a couple months later, we went back to meet him again and we trained them over and over. And he showed us an image on his cell phone of his 17-year-old brother. And the image was of his brother being beheaded. And we were in shock. And we said to him, well, what does this mean? And he said, well, it's a warning. And we said, well, will you be able to, to still stand up for peace and freedom? Will you still be able to defend the rights of these persecuted groups? Because obviously, if you do, this is you know, what's going to happen to you. And he said, Tina, if I don't stand up for the freedom of others, this is the fate that awaits every person in Iraq. Um, uh, you know, as a Christian, to hear that this Muslim judge was willing to risk his life to defend persecuted Christians and Yazidis and people that don't believe like him Maybe you've never heard of something like that before. Um, in Sudan, the people that defended the young woman that we helped um, gain freedom, they were all Muslim lawyers. And around the world, we've met a lot of people that are willing to stand up and defend freedom because they have that same understanding as this judge. They recognize that either we defend it for everyone or we're all gonna suffer eventually. Now, not everyone has come to that understanding, but there are little peacemakers here and there that give us glimmers of hope that it's possible. It's possible to change a society when you can change one person like that, that will have a ripple effect on what happens. Um, some of the teachers that attended our training, uh, they designed a lesson that has been very powerful in Iraq and has opened up opportunities to, to to plant many more seeds of freedom there amongst these children that were so affected by ISIS. So I want to share that with you. The, um, there are two Yazidi men that I met, and the Yazidis have gone through like 72 genocides in their history in Iraq. And so these two Yazidi men, I said, well, what makes you still keep going when you've experienced so many genocides? And he said, well, if we didn't learn how to forgive, we would never be able to move forward. But isn't that the truth? Because Christ has called us to forgiveness, right? And there's a power in that. So these two men developed a lesson where they took all these refugee kids to a garden. And they said, look at this garden. It's so beautiful. And the kids then were asked to go and make bouquets of flowers. And they did. And they came back. And um, uh, they weren't allowed to choose one color flower. So then when they came back, they looked at the garden. And they're like, oh, no, we've destroyed this garden. And the teacher said, well, this is what's happened in our country, in Iraq, because ISIS destroyed everybody except for the people that looked like them. And um, the students remembered, they had flashbacks of what had happened. And the teacher said, but we, we can live in this destroyed garden, or we can live in the beautiful one. Which would you prefer? And they all said, oh, we want the beautiful one. He said, okay, now it's going to be hard. So he gave them a packet of seeds, and he said, um, he put them in pairs, and he said, we want you to, each of the pairs, to learn about one another, to learn why the other person deserves religious freedom, 
and to plant these seeds in this garden. So they went through this process. They had to overcome a lot of fear and hatred of one another. Um, if you've lived with people where your whole life you're, you've only witnessed religious killings and conflict and hatred, then you probably wouldn't feel very safe next to somebody of a different faith either. But they worked through it. And through that process, they came to see one another differently. They began to have empathy for one another. They began to want to help one another, especially as these refugees were returning back to their villages. And then at the end, the teacher said, look, the, planting the seeds of freedom, this is hard work. But if we don't do it, then this destroyed garden is the reality that we're going to be living in forever cycle after cycle after cycle of hate and violence and conflict and terrorism. Doesn't matter how many warplanes we have or humanitarian aid we have, they're only band-aids because the deeper root is in the heart, which we know. So these children um, were really inspired to actually defend one another's freedom. They became peacemakers. Then the, the government and Kurdistan Iraq was so moved by this this change that they saw happening, little gardens popping up and kids beginning to not hate, to overcome their trauma and their fear of one another, that um, they said, Tina, we want, we want every kid here in this area to learn about religious freedom. So if you know anything about the Middle East, you know that that's not normal. <laughs> religious freedom is a foreign concept there. Um, that's not something they've ever been taught or known. So for a government in the Middle East to say, we want 2.4 million children to learn to value religious freedom is amazing. It's amazing. It's a miracle. So we said, absolutely. So we've um, started looking for funding. And in the coming years, we're going to be planting those seeds in the hearts of these children that will have a ripple effect, that will make them peacemakers in their own society, that will ensure that the church in Iraq that is on the verge of erasure has the strength and the freedom to survive and to flourish, to be a witness, to be a testament of the true freedom that we can have in this life, right? But they do that because there are peacemakers in their society willing to stand up in defense of their religious freedom. Um, when I started, I shared how, how much we live in a broken society right now. And um, I was speaking at another chapel out in Virginia last week. And it, I was really burdened by um, just the, in our... In our country right now, there's a lot of hatred or um, just, just intolerance towards people of different faiths. And when I'm in the Middle East, I've never, I've never been in threat. I've never been in danger. Somebody in uh, Dr. Farhadian's class asked me this yesterday. Um, I've had Muslims and Hindus and you name it, people working with me and helping me to help them. God's given me this ministry to, to stand in the defense of religious freedom for all people. And, but I'm always convicted when I come home and I, I see our society not be able to do that. Um, we often take for granted, it makes me very emotional, we often take for granted in America the freedom that we have, the freedom to be here to worship, um, but this simple act is just not a reality for most people in the world. And if we want to keep this space for freedom open, when we have a majority voice, let's say, in a country like this, we've got to be willing to stand up and defend it. Because when we're in the minority, when the body of Christ is the minority in a different country, who will be that voice for them? There are a lot of people around us, we don't agree with them theologically, but they're human beings that God created in his image. And they deserve dignity and the freedom to worship whatever they choose, even if they choose to reject Christ. It's how they're hardwired. It's how we're all hardwired. And I want each of you to have that freedom. Now, in 10 years, in 20 years, I want my children to have it. I want everybody in the world to have it. And unless we become the peacemakers that are willing to say that religious freedom is valuable, 
not just as a social justice issue that we care about one day and we forget about the next when the new fad happens, but as part of who we are as Christians, that we are peacemakers, especially when we live in freedom, we have the opportunity to help those that are living in persecution. It should become part of who we are. Because when I was, I was in Morocco when Charlottesville happened. I live in Richmond, Virginia, like 45 minutes away. And I was sitting in Morocco with a group of Muslim teachers who were asking me how they could defend Jewish people from being persecuted in their country. And in Charlottesville, we had nutty people protesting and yelling anti-Semitic comments about Jews. And I, it was just, just, it was just sad, just sad. Um, so as I leave, you know, at the end of the Beatitudes, um, there's a message. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? Um, you are the light of the world, and a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, the work that God's called me to in these last 20 years has been just that. Like, he's given us this light to shine to the world. We have true freedom that we can give them, and sometimes it happens by showing them that we believe so much that they have dignity as human beings that we're willing to stand in defense of it even if they reject Christ. That is a powerful testimony and witness, but it is the testimony and witness of Christ and his church for the world. And that light will shine in the darkness, and people will come to see who he really is through that. And I've seen it over and over again in these different countries. But if we believe that we can, um, if we believe that we can um, just worship here today without ever investing in this freedom for the future, then we're very foolish. Ten years ago, I shared this with Dr. Farahadian's class, um, the number of people in the world that were living under persecution was about 67% of the world's population. And when it was measured again by the Pew Research Center in 2017, the number had grown to um, 79%. So about 8 out of 10 or 4 out of 5 people in the world. So in 10 more years, or in 20 more years, you'll be my age. Yes, you will get there. What will that freedom look like? Is that space going to shrink or is it going to expand? And it only depends on what you do today. Are you prepared to be a peacemaker in this world? That ministry of reconciliation. Never giving up the truth of the gospel, but loving people regardless of whether they choose it or not. Being willing to stand in defense of their freedom. Making space for more freedom in the world. That's what Hardwired is all about. That's what we do. When you leave today, we have three different things that you can do. First, you can pray. Pray for us. Pray for the ministry. Pray for freedom. Pray what it means, what God's calling you to. Second, um, these children in Iraq that have gone through our lessons, there's 600 of them. Next week, we'll travel back um, to the Middle East, and we'll be delivering backpacks to these children with little messages and books about religious freedom and the dignity that they have. And if you want to fill a backpack, you can get a card on your way out and learn how to do that. And then the third thing you can do is that on our website, um, hardwiredglobal.org, there's a, a journey map that you can print off. And you can sign up to actually challenge yourself to learn what this freedom means in the coming years or months. And every month, we gave you another challenge to learn what it means. But I challenge you, learn to be a peacemaker, because freedom really does depend on it. Thank you. I should pray.